In this video tutorial, we will discuss the digestive system. All right, so you were asked to read the textbook and fill out this worksheet. Let's see how you did. So, the digestive system. Every cell in your body requires nutrients to survive. But, due to specialization, not all cells are equipped to absorb nutrients directly from the external environment. So when the cells in my lungs require nutrients, they have to rely on someone else. They are so specialized at absorbing oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide, they don't have the ability to break down food. So to solve this problem, two organ systems are used. The first is the digestive system. Its job is to take in food, digest it, which means to break it down to raw materials, and excrete the waste. Now the digestive system includes the digestive tract and accessory organs. Meanwhile, the circulatory system is designed to transport the nutrients from the digestive system to all the cells that make up the organism. Now let's take a look at the digestive tract of the earthworm. The digestive tract is essentially a long tube with openings at either end. Food comes in the mouth, waste goes out the anus. As food travels down the pharynx and esophagus, it is stored in the crop. It then enters the gizzard where it's ground up and broken down further, so it can travel down the intestine where the nutrients are absorbed into the body. Whatever can't be absorbed is excreted out as waste. Now the earthworm is a very simplified version of our digestive tract. In more higher level animals like us, the digestive tract is a little more complicated and requires the assistance of accessory organs in order for the food to be digested properly. Now the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine, and the anus are part of the digestive tract because they actually come in contact with the food. Meanwhile, accessory organs like the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, they don't actually come in contact with the food, not physically anyway. Instead, they release special enzymes, special gastric juices that are necessary to help break down the food and further digest them before they can be absorbed into our bodies. So once again, these organs at the top over here are part of the digestive tract because they actually touch the food. They come in contact with the food itself. While these organs down here are called accessory organs because they never actually touch the food. They don't come into physical contact with it, but they are still part of the digestive system and play an important role by releasing chemicals that help to further digest the food. So both parts of the digestive system play an important role in breaking down the food but only one set actually touches the food physically. Now, have you ever eaten potato chips before where you didn't quite chew it up properly and so there was one piece that was still too large and as it went down your throat, you can feel it being squeezed down as it makes its way through the esophagus. And when it finally passes through, you just start eating like an animal again, like nothing happened. Well, that squeezing sensation is called peristalsis. This is muscular contractions of the digestive tract. So the esophagus is one giant muscle that squeezes and pushes your food down into the stomach. You don't need gravity to pull the food down to your stomach. The muscles in the esophagus will do that for you. And that's why you can swallow water or eat food while standing on your head. I don't recommend it though because you might choke. Now because food is constantly being pushed along the digestive tract and rubbing against the inside of the tube, epithelial cells are used to cover and protect the digestive tract. Now this tissue contains a variety of different cell types, each with a specific function. For example, goblet cells secrete mucus, and the mucus is used to protect the digestive tube. First, this slimy mucus helps to lubricate the esophagus and also the rest of the digestive tract, so there's less friction with the food as it's being pushed along. Meanwhile, in the stomach, the mucus lines the interior so that the stomach acid that's there to break down the food doesn't break down the stomach itself. So the mucus gets broken down by the stomach acid instead of the cells of the stomach. However, sometimes the mucus is not created properly or there's not enough of the mucus being produced and what happens is the stomach acid will start to eat into the stomach itself and we call those ulcers. All right, let's take a look at the human digestive tract. So digestion first starts in the mouth. So digestion begins in the mouth where food is broken up by your teeth. This is called mechanical digestion because you're physically crushing it, you're physically breaking it apart. Meanwhile, your salivary glands release saliva, and that saliva helps to moisten and lubricate the food as it travels down your digestive tract. Your saliva also contains amylase, a type of enzyme that helps digest carbohydrates. This is called chemical digestion, where you're not physically breaking down the food, but using chemicals like amylase to do it for you. The pharynx is responsible for swallowing the food, 
which at this point has been chewed up and is starting chemical digestion, so we call it bolus. And the esophagus pushes the bolus down using muscular contractions called peristalsis until the bolus enters the stomach. Now the stomach stores the food and churns it around, which means the food, the bolus, is being mechanically broken up again as the stomach squeezes it back and forth to physically break it up even further. Stomach acid, which is mainly hydrochloric acid, continues the process of chemical digestion. This activates enzymes, breaks up the food, and kills any germs you may have swallowed. As I mentioned before, the goblet cells that line the walls of the stomach are secreting mucus to help protect the stomach from all these chemicals. But if that mucus isn't working properly, the chemicals will start to digest the stomach, giving us stomach ulcers, which are holes in the stomach. Now on either side of the stomach, one at the top, one at the bottom, we have muscles called sphincters that help to shut off these tubes, preventing the food from escaping while the stomach is churning about and squeezing this food back and forth. These muscles will relax and open the tube when the stomach is ready to accept food or release food. However, as we grow older, these muscles get weaker. And that's why older people tend to get indigestion or heartburn after a large meal. Because these muscles are weakened, some of the stomach acid may be squirted back up. As it burns the esophagus, we call it heartburn because it's in the area of the heart, even though it's not burning the heart itself. This area near your heart feels like it's burning, which technically it is, it is a chemical burn. So, growing old sucks. Now, once the partially digested food leaves the stomach, we call it chyme, all right? So when the food leaves the bolus after just being chewed a little bit with a little bit of saliva, you call it bolus. But once the food has been partially digested in the stomach, it's called chyme. Well, at this point, the chyme mixes with enzymes that are released by the liver and the gallbladder. So these two are your accessory organs. They don't actually physically touch the food, but they release those enzymes, those chemicals that helps to break down the food. So for instance, the gallbladder releases bile, and bile is important for the digestion of oils and fats. So I have a friend who had to have their gallbladder removed, and now they can no longer digest fats and oils properly. As such, they had to adjust their diet, and they can no longer eat greasy foods. Once again, growing old sucks. Anyway, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, these are all accessory organs. They don't actually touch the food, but they are important because they release digestive enzymes that help to further break down our food. Now, as the chyme leaves the stomach, it enters the small intestine. And the small intestine is the longest part of the digestive tract. It has to be super long in order to give the body time to absorb the nutrients from the food. If the intestine is too short, there would be a lot of wasted nutrients inside the feces as it exits the anus, and that just would not be very efficient. On average, the small intestine is about 7 meters long, or about 3.5 times the length of your body. After most of the nutrients have been absorbed by the small intestine, it then enters the large intestine. Now just so you know, the large intestine is not longer than the small intestine, but it is wider than the small intestine. Here, the large intestine is responsible for reabsorbing some water and ions, as well as forming and storing the feces. So when you have diarrhea, something's not quite right here. The food is moving too quickly through it and not giving the large intestine enough time to reabsorb that water. And because there's a lot of excess water, well, you know what happens there. Now at the end of the digestive tract, we have the rectum. This is where feces is stored. When the rectum is full, it sends a signal to the brain telling you to go to the washroom. At that point, the anus it relaxes and the rectum pushes and feces comes out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our digestive system.